Today's sermon title, Jesus versus Religion, Id Est, the Religion of Man. To be clear, you know God, Jesus versus religion. Jesus, God, is not anti-religion, okay? He gave us the Bible. He set up the church. He established the church. God is not anti-religion. He's against what people do with it in his name. He's against what people do with Christianity in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. He's against how we try to twist something wonderful and supernatural into something that's just like everything else in this world. Give me what I want or I'm going to pout. Uh, do for me this, God. Uh, I'll push the right buttons. Show me the minimum effort I have to do to get out of you, God, what I want you to give me. We treat God like a lucky rabbit's foot. Imagine the blasphemy in that. God of the universe humbles himself to come alongside of us and say, I love you just as you are. I'll forgive everything. And, we're, and we say, just hold on, hold on. That, the love stuff is nice, but I got a list. I need boom, 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 boom. And I need this. And by the way, my neighbor, could you just get a little Old Testament on him? Could you just smite him? You know, we, we, uh, we treat God like this cosmic vending machine and we try to twist something beautiful into something that just is there to serve us. So we can get on some high perch and look down at the rest of the world. Imagine the sin. When we, we should all be at the foot of the cross. And it's a wicked, wicked thing to use Christianity so we can look, get up here high and look down at every people as if we didn't come to God on our knees, as if we would be utterly lost without the blood of Jesus Christ. Who do we think we are? Let's humble ourselves before mighty God and just let the grace wash over us. And then let's see somebody else who's different or, in, or who's living their life a different way or whatever and say, come to Jesus. There's power in the blood and God loves you. And I don't want my ego or my culture or my feelings of superiority to do anything to keep you away because you already have to stumble against your own pride. I don't want my pride to get in your way. Your pride's enough for you. Last week, <clears throat> we saw Jesus go to this fig tree. And he goes to the tree for nourishment, nourishment. And when he didn't find any, he cursed the tree and it withered up. He cursed it and it withered, and we said that people will no, he said that people will no longer go to this fig tree for food. In the same way, God was declaring that no longer would people go to the temple in Jerusalem to be spiritually nourished. People would go there. They were looking for something. It was not there. God was bringing his next step. Remember the encounter between Jesus? Remember that story between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well? Remember that? He goes to the, the water with the well and he says, Give me a drink of water. And, and she says, Well, why should a guy be talking to me? And why should a Jew be talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. The Samaritans, the Jews hated each other. The Samaritans were like part, partially Jew or they're Gentiles that had brought a lot of uh, Jewish characteristics along with them. Uh, they believed some of the scriptures. But the Jews and the Samaritans didn't have anything to do with each other. And Jesus was there, and he asked for some water. And, and uh, she didn't know who he was. He said, if you did know who I was, you would be asking for living water because I could give you uh, water that would save your soul. She said to him, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Then she asked a theological question. This is good. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Don't you love Jesus? I mean, <clears throat> he's there and he's loving, but he's also <clears throat> not going to mince the truth just to be soft. You Samaritans, yeah, two religions, Judaism, what you guys got in, in Samaria. He doesn't say, oh, it's all the same or all we find... He says, you guys, you've got it wrong. The Jewish people got the Old Testament. They got it right. <laughs> you know, he's just real clear. You Jews, you Samaritans, you worship, but you don't know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. 
Next time you turn on the History Channel and you got some guy up there saying Christianity is a uh, Greek invention, they, then they try to put on some Jewish trappings to give it credit. Oh, give me a break. The Jews were a, were a small, despised minority in the Roman Empire. Nobody would write this from a Greek perspective, trying to bring in Jewishness all the time, make it a Jewish Messiah, self say salvation is from the Jews, and spend all this time dealing with Jewish culture. Obviously, Christianity arose, arose from Judea. Obviously. And uh, just keep that in mind. Next, just because a guy's on TV, and, and we can vouch for that here at Foundation, just because somebody's on TV doesn't know what they're talking about. You... you Okay, that's too much laughter at this point. Uh, what a glorious day. Jesus says salvation is from the Jews. We've got our Bible from the Jewish people. God chose the Jewish people to bring us the scriptures, to bring us the prophets. Our Messiah, our Savior, came, is Jewish, came from the Jewish people. And God still has plans for the people of Israel. He's not done with them yet. We're actually going to see a little bit of that today. But salvation came from the Jewish people. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they were the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. True worshipers. Remember last week we were talking about this picture of heaven? <clears throat> How God is gathering to himself. True worshipers, and the Bible says, from every tribe, every language, every nation. Isn't that beautiful? Every single tribe, every single language, there are people coming to Christ all over the world. All over the world, people are coming to Christ. They may dress differently than you. They may eat things that you don't want to eat. Uh, their language might sound kind of funny to you, but you know what? It's glorious and beautiful when they say, Jesus Christ died for my sins. Thank you, God. I don't care what language that's in. That is beautiful. The Bible says before the throne of God will be all these multitudes of people from all over the world, all these different cultures. They're your brother. They're your sister. And, Jesus, and God has done this to bring us uh, all into one big family, every people from all over the world. What does it mean to be a worshiper? Well, it's not Jesus is my homeboy. It's more than that. It, it's not... Uh, I like God because he brings me good luck. I put a little cross on my car, you see, to keep me safe when I drive recklessly. No. Being a worshiper is not somebody who says, well, I'm an American. I believe in God. I go to church at least on Easter and Christmas, and it's very meaningful to me. Yeah. I'm a very spiritual person. It's more than that. Worshiping God is finding liberation so we can get outside of the trap of perpetual self-orientation. Setting our orbit, the orbit of our lives, our lives orbit around what we worship. Is it our self? Is it our work? Is it the things we want to acquire? Is it, is it popularity? A certain degree of comfort? When we say we worship God, it's more than seeing Christmas music squinting our eyes in a kind of holy way. You know, there's a holy way to squint your eyes. And, and, and putting your hands in the air. And, and, and uh, those things are fine. Boy, I was testifying. That's beautiful music. It's okay to put your hand in the air. Uh, but it's much, much more than that. That in and of itself can just be a show. True worship is not just externally doing religion or doing rituals or doing ceremonies. Worship takes place when I understand that God is bigger than me. And his ways are better than my ways. And I want to get on my knees before God. And I would say, God, everything you are, I adore. Everything about you, I want to be about that. Where you want me to go, I want to go. What you want me to do, I want to do. I worship you. Wow, you are so wonderful. Let my life orbit around you. Everything in my life. 
And I learned it's not, there's no contest. Everything about God is greater than me, better. And I love everything about him. I want my life, I want to live a life that reflects that. And when I fail and mess up, I want to say, Lord, forgive. Because guess what? Even in failure, we can reflect God's goodness. Thank God, right? Thank you, Jesus. Even failure, we can demonstrate the power of the cross because Jesus still loves me, warts and all. He didn't kick away his children. And so we sing to God. We praise God. And yes, it can be a very emotional thing. It is for me. Because he's so great and he's so admirable. And everything about him, I want to be that. I want to be a part of that. He is worth living our lives for. That's worship. That's worth living my life for. Not the vacation home, not the yacht. Those things are not sins, okay? They're not worth orienting your life around. He is worth my life. He and he alone. Nothing else on this planet in that sense, including our own personal lives, is worthy of every breath I take, every heartbeat. Only he is worthy. Nothing else is so grand, so beautiful, so good. I want to fall in love with goodness. I know following Dan Wolferon doesn't do me any good. I want to follow him. Human religion has all the trappings of worship and faith. Human religion can look real on the outside. But when we exclude God, we just use his name and a dim echo of who he is in order to get what we want. That's, uh, that's fleshy. There's nothing special about that. You don't need to be a Christian to be a part of that. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it didn't provide nourishment. And God closed the era of the temple and the sacrificial system because it was something that had pointed the way to Christ. And when Christ came, it was no longer needed. Once Jesus came and offered the perfect sacrifice, there was no longer any need for foreshadowing, right? The author doesn't keep foreshadowing after the event happens in the novel. You build up to the event, and then you move on from there. The sacrificial system was foreshadowing the coming of Jesus Christ. His great sacrifice for our sins. The blood of animals had to be sacrificed again and again and again. The blood of the perfect Lamb of God, one time for all time for all people. But there's a warning here as well for the church. It's at, for our church and a warning for all churches. There's something called mission drift. Have you ever heard of mission drift? Uh, an organization can start off with a strong purpose. And then over time, sometimes maliciously, but oftentimes good people start to add other things to the plate and other things. And then they get a really strong leader in this area. So they say, well, we should do this. And they get somebody strong in that area and we should do this. Pretty soon their mission to go this way has been taken off course and they're going another way. And that can even happen to churches. Churches say, we're here to share the message of Jesus Christ. We want people to get saved. We want people to be forgiven. We want Heaven's doors are wide open and so many people are walking the other way. We want to grab as many people on our way to heaven and bring them into the kingdom. But churches that start off strong can start to drift. Not always for bad reasons. This is a good thing, and that's a good thing, and that's a good thing. You get busy doing good things, and you miss the best thing. You miss the reason Christ died. We miss the reason we were put here on this planet. You ever, we talked about this before. You ever think, when you became a Christian, why wasn't it just beam me up, Scotty, and you're up in heaven? Because we have a purpose and we have a mission right here, right now. God's not taking us because we're supposed to live our lives in a way that will bring people to Jesus Christ. So there's a warning against the church here. If God would curse the fig tree, if he would, he would say, okay, the temple is no longer the place to go for nourishment, what happens with mission drift? God can say, you know, that church, it's no longer the place where you're going to find spiritual nourishment. They're not going to call you to get on your knees. They're not going to call you to humble yourself before mighty God. They're going to tickle your ears, and that's not a church anymore. Everybody hear me? It doesn't matter how big your steeple is. It doesn't matter how big the cross is. 
if they're not talking about the cross, if they're not explaining why Jesus had to die for our sins. This warning you can find in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, from verse 11, Apostle Paul is writing, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Again I ask, he's talking about the Jewish people, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Have you ever wondered that? The schism between the Jewish people and the Christian church, is it beyond recovery? Did they stumble so far? And remember, the man who's talking is a Jew. Paul was a Jewish Christian. He was a Jew who was persecuting, destroying the church of Jesus Christ. He met the resurrected Jesus Christ, and that had an effect on him. And he went on to live his life. He was tortured. He was shipwrecked. He was hit in the head with stones to the point that the people doing it thought he was dead. He was beaten, and he was ultimately executed probably by Emperor Nero for his, for, for his efforts to share with the world that there is a real God, and he really loves you, and he cares. So he, Paul's writing, did the Jewish people stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, because they set aside God, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. In other words, God still has a plan for Israel, doesn't he? Still has a plan for the Jewish people. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, and if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? And God is looking to this future time when the Jew people of Israel, when the Jewish people come to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. The Bible says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced and mourn. What have we done? I'm talking to you Gentiles, Paul says, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I'm Jewish, but I'm an apostle to you guys because you guys didn't know anything, and I had to bring this truth to you. I take pride in my ministry, Paul writes, in the hope that I may somehow rouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And can you imagine the day, and there's more Jewish Christians today than there ever has been since this first century. More, more Jews are coming to Christ than ever before. And Paul is saying, when the Jewish people embrace Jesus Christ, it's going to bring incredible salvation to the world because people are going to look at that. They're going to marvel. Is some of the branches, he's talking about this wild tree, okay, and you, you break off a branch. You ever seen that done with the apple tree? And then you graft in another kind of branch, a different kind of apple, and you wrap it up and you, so that you can have... Sometimes two, three different kinds of apples growing off one apple tree. Have you ever seen that? That's what he's talking about right here. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, the olive tree is Israel, right? Because our religion is based on what? The scriptures. God revealed himself to a chosen people, the people of Israel. The Messiah, the prophets, it all came from the Jewish people. They are, the brand, they are the tree that we have been attached to. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, Gentiles, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap, we are nourished from this, what God did with the Jewish people, and from the olive root, do not consider yourself superior to those other branches. And every time... So-called Christianity has looked down on and persecuted the Jewish people. It's because they didn't know their Bibles, they didn't love God, and they didn't love other people. Do not think you're superior to God's chosen people. God brought us our faith through the people of Israel. Do not consider yourself superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, if you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And if some preacher stands up in front of you and says otherwise, he's arguing with the scripture. You will then say, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Paul says, granted. Granted, okay, yeah. But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches... He will not spare you either. 
And we're not talking here about individuals losing their faith. We're talking about churches no longer being a place of nourishment. And God's saying, I'm done with that church. They're no longer a place where nourishment can be found. If God did not spare the natural branches, don't just assume because the church was good 20 years ago that God still has use for it today. We should tremble. Lord God, we don't want mission drift. We don't want to miss the point. Lord God, we don't want to become a holy huddle. Lord God, we don't want to be comfortable just seeing the same faces week after week. We don't want to just come here because we enjoy seeing each other's company. Lord God, we're on a mission. We want to share the love of Jesus Christ with as many people we can because not only is heaven a real place, but hell is a real place as well. And Jesus Christ died on the cross so that many, many, many people could be saved and go to heaven. And I want to live my life and I want our church the life of this church to be lived in such a way that we're bringing as many people as we can through those gates in heaven. And Jesus Christ said through the Apostle Paul, do not be proud, but tremble. Because if I broke off the natural branches, I'll break off this church as well. And it's a warning to all churches, including ours. Let's not miss the purpose, the reason why we're here. When people are looking for nourishment... And they, and they say, oh, I'm going to try church today. And all we've got for them is nice, frilly fluff. Never explain why Jesus Christ died on the cross. What a crime. That person comes in the door saying, I, I want to find some truth. I want to find God. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with this world? And all they get is games, nice, fun stuff to tickle your ears. What a crime. What a missed opportunity. In heaven, God looks down. And he says, I died for this person. Can't you tell them about that? Can't we let them know that there's forgiveness for sin? Can't you, can't you let them know that there's room at the foot of the cross? And especially when we start to use religion to build ourselves up, to bring glory to ourselves instead of glory to God, and we start to look at other people because of their sins just happen to be different than our own sins. The way their culture, I don't like the way they talk. I can't stand their language. I can't stand the way they drink. I can't stand the way they act. I can't stand their food. Oh, God. In my preferences, are you going to build a wall up so somebody has to overcome me to get to that cross? God forbid. I don't want to get in the way of that. I don't want to get in the way of somebody coming to Jesus. It'd be better that God destroys this church. It'd be better that God would destroy this church than we come, become a place that pushes people away from God or, or they come here and all they get is fluff. Uh, I don't want to come to that church. I wouldn't be part of a church like that. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1 from verse 23. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to read 23 through 32. All right, everybody there? Matthew 21 from verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked, who gave you this authority? So what was Jesus doing? Well, he was doing a couple different things. He was teaching and he was cleansing. He went right into that temple, and the people were coming from all over, not only the Roman Empire, but the Parthian Empire, and, and from India and in Spain. They were coming from all over the place in order to worship God. And when they got there, they were being ripped off by these people who were exchanging different currencies, different money, right in the temple. They were being ripped off. So you come to the temple of God to meet with God, and the people there were acting in such a way that would push them away. And so Jesus went and he ripped over those tables. He said, my church, 
My temple is supposed to be a place, my house is supposed to be a, a place of prayer for all people, and you're making it a den of thieves. And then he started teaching. Well, the, the, uh, the temple priests here, these guys, are, are the Sadducees. We talked about this before, remember? They don't believe in angels. They didn't believe in all the Old Testament. They thought that this life is all you get. When you're dead, there's no, there's no uh, life afterwards. So that's why they were sad, you see? And so uh, these, these were the Sadducees, and we, we kind of think like they were the um, kind of the religious liberals of the day. And then the Pharisees, the really legalistic guys that uh, were not only taking the Old Testament, but a lot of human tradition and putting it down on people, they were like the religious conservatives of the day, and God had problems with both of them. Uh, however, many of the Pharisees were later able to repent and say, no, no, Jesus is the Messiah, but the Sadducees, we don't have a record of those guys coming to faith. They were the rich. They were, not, they were in charge of the money. They were in charge of the military. They, were, they uh, traveled in the elite circles. They, and, uh, they were often uh, cooperating with the Roman Empire in order to keep their high positions. And they didn't like Jesus going in there, big surprise, and turning over the money tables because they were getting their cut, of course. Uh, they didn't like Jesus going in there and teaching and, and uh, making them look bad. So he said, by what authority are you doing these things? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. And he talks about John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist was out in the, the wilderness, and everybody was coming to him, and he was baptizing them. And he was calling people to repent, repent, repent. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God came in Jesus Christ. But he, uh, he challenged the king and said, you shouldn't have taken your wife's brother. And so the king had his head cut off but he spoke bravely to authority. And so the people thought correctly that John the Baptist was a prophet, like the Old Testament prophets. So Jesus said, I will ask you one question. John the Bapt uh, John's baptism, where did that come from? Was it from heaven or human origin? They discussed it among themselves. Like that. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will then ask, well, why didn't you believe him? But if they say, but if we say of human origin, well, we're afraid of the crowds of people because they thought he was a prophet. So they said to Jesus, uh, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things because they would not have listened to him anyways. What do you think, Jesus goes on to teach. There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later, he changed his mind, and he went. Then the father went to his other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you guys. Oh, Jesus really wasn't big on political correctness. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, even after you saw their changed lives, you did not repent and believe him. The first son was... Uh, either lazy or pos possibly given to loose living. He certainly was insolent. I will not. He was disobedient. He said, there's no way I want to go and work in the vineyard. <laughs> Next thing you know, you turn around, whoa, there he is. He's out there working, serving God with God's people. The guy who said, I'm not going to do that, you look around, and there he is. There he is. But the other brother had all the religious talk Praise Jesus. you got to have a southern accent. I'm sorry, southern people. It just came out. Uh, I just want to do. I had a southerner making a fist at me back there. My fault. My bad. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. I just want to do whatever God asks of me. But guess what? The guy with all the talk, he never showed up. He never showed up. All he had was faith that was like a centimeter thick. So who obeyed? The guy who repented and got his hands dirty and got busy doing what he should have been doing all along. Now, before 
before we move on, I just want to stress one thing. You know, there's nothing special about being a, a prostitute or a swindler. The tax collectors in those days would, would take more than they're supposed to take so they could line their own pro pockets. They were cheating people. There's nothing special about that. You don't get brownie points in heaven because you're a prostitute. Uh, that should be obvious, but some people don't talk like that. Uh, Jesus didn't praise people who were messed up because they were messed up. Do you get that? He didn't praise them over the people whose lives were externally faithful because they were so sinful. He praised only those who reflected on their lives. The Bible says he thought about it. The next thing you know, he's out in the field. Jesus praises the prostitutes and the swindlers who reflected on their lives. They repented. They said, God, your ways are right. My way is not. And they went to work in the vineyard. God is calling all of us. Now, I wrote to lies of faithful service, but I believe that's incorrect. God is not calling us to lies. God is calling us to lives of faithful service. You just can't trust what's ever written down here, boy. That was uh, probably spelled correct. God is calling us all to lives of faithful service. It doesn't matter where we've been. It doesn't matter what we've done. What matters is how we answer the call right here, right now. God is calling. How are we going to respond? God has a purpose for you, sister, brother. God has a purpose for you to work in his service for his glory. You get to be in this movement that glorifies God, that's winning souls, this movement of love, that the purpose of this movement that Christ died to begin, this church, the purpose is to love people close to God so that we can have this big party in heaven forever, and you get to be a part of that. That's a purpose, a mission, not a meaningless life of just sucking air, eating food, having it come out the backside and doing it again, cycle one, cycle two, again and again. Bring others to faith in Christ. Jesus is calling us all. Brothers and sisters, how are you going to respond this morning? Amen. We don't want to be among those who refuse to believe, fail to serve, and miss the opportunity to come clean about our sins. Acknowledge God's ways and walk in faith. Now, even though God has done away with the rituals surrounding the temple at this time, there's nothing wrong with ritual. There's nothing innately wrong about ritual. Sometimes we think, oh, ceremonies are... But no, there's nothing wrong with ceremonies. Ceremonies can be very good, in fact. Uh, ceremony for graduation service. When I graduated high school, I didn't want to go. My parents made me. Uh, and the fact that you couldn't get your diploma unless you went. Uh, but graduation ceremonies are important because it's drawing a line before you pretty much did what all your teachers wanted you to do you're kind of forced to get along through life and now you're gonna to have to start looking at making sure you if you go on to higher education you get that grade you have to uh, get a job you have to start thinking about taking care of yourself that's a big line how about a wedding ceremony you can go to the courthouse just sign a piece of paper and say we're married pinky promise or you can stand up in front of people and say before my friends before my family before God Almighty we are united, and we're not going to give up on this. I'm not going to walk out when it gets difficult. We're in this for life. Amen. So ceremony is not a bad thing, is it? Some of these ceremonies are very important because they draw lines in our life. We can put a flag and say, yes, I was married. I can remember the day. These monumental moments have to be cemented into our heads and into our hearts, and they also build community. Have you thought about that? We, I'm, I'm going to get married. Why don't you come? And the whole community gets there, and we have fun. We're going to have a baby. Uh, we'll have a baby shower, and everybody comes out to that. And, and we draw together. It helps to make us one family. We share these events. We make memories together. And then in the future, boy, you don't want to leave your wife, because then where do you share all those memories with? You don't want to leave your friends, because then all those memories mean nothing. Almost all Christians celebrate the ceremonies of baptism and the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, Eucharist. Then some churches have a few more rituals. For us, we celebrate baby dedications, right? We had ordinations uh, of deacons and pastors in, in the Super Bowl, right? We've got our, 
our uh, rituals. Uh, today we're going to celebrate communion. And with communion, what we do is, uh, well, one thing, we eat together at this church every week. And Jesus says when you come together, remember him. And that's actually a communion service that resembles the first century communion a little more than the ritual of just a little piece of bread and a little piece of a little juice, you know. They're eating together. But we do this in the church as a ritual to remember again and again and again, wait, I'm not here because I'm such a good and perfect person. So I'm here because Jesus laid down his life and bled his blood for me. So that means what if I act like a real selfish person this week? Do I not deserve to be in church? Well, I never deserved to be in church in the first place. So I ought to go make it right and apologize to the people I need to apologize to, and then I should go and be part of what God's people are doing. And today, as a community, together, we're going to take communion to say, I'm reliant on the body of Christ. I'm reliant on the blood of Christ. And so are my brothers and sisters. We're one family. Together, we need what Jesus Christ offered for us. Uh, why don't we all turn to Matthew? Go forward a few chapters right now to Matthew chapter 26. And I really, uh, I'm just like you guys. I get tired of hearing Dan's voice. And so I would like us to read this silently. And uh, guys, Matthew chapter 26, please listen. Please listen. 17 through 30, read it on your own right now and pray. Engage in the text. Read it and pray. Ask God for understanding and ask God to help you humble yourself before holy God. So please read Matthew 26, 17 through 30 right now. Jesus Christ went to the cross because I'm a nasty, hard-headed, foolish, self-centered sinner, and he loves me. If we're sitting here and it's easier for us to think about other people's sins instead of our own, we're kind of missing it. None righteous, not even one. And if you're sitting here thinking you're not worthy, and you go, yeah, that's correct. And you're thinking God doesn't love you, that's incorrect. Then you're also not getting it. God loves you. God loves you. He didn't throw away his kids. He didn't get tired of us because we fail. 
the love that put, sent Jesus Christ to the cross 2,000 years ago is not dimmed with time. If he was willing to go to the cross for you and me when we didn't care about him, when we didn't like him, we didn't want to be with him. Brothers and sisters, you came here today, right? And if you're honest with yourself, you know you messed up inside. Right? Right? But where are you today? You're in church because you want to be here and you want to be with God's people and you say, my life, Lord God, it's yours. I messed up, but here's where I am Sunday after Sunday after Sunday because I want to be one of your children. I want to live for you. I want to be with you. And God loves you. And he doesn't get tired of us. He doesn't divorce us and he doesn't throw us away. I want us to think about those things right now. Jesus Christ would have died on the cross if you were the only person on the planet and you were the one who spit on him and hammered those nails into his hands and feet. He still would have died for you. And we have a risen Savior. He didn't stay in that grave. He rose again. And he's promised us. He's promised us for those who believe that death is not the end. There's victory. And he's called us then to live lives that will bring people in. He says, go out into, uh, into all the nations, teaching them to obey everything I've taught you. And that's the mission of the church. And if you're a Christian, that's your mission as well. That's our purpose. I would like to have the uh, deacons come forward at this time. Aaron, Gary. And uh, if you guys could get the elements and then come stand here. And uh, one of you there, one of you here. And uh, today we're going to have uh, those of you who have put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm going to have Jerry here pray in a moment. And then I want you to come forward as a statement. I'm standing with God's people. I need this. And uh, I'm identifying myself with Jesus Christ's death. And I'm also identifying myself with God's people. So come forward and uh, take the uh, elements. And bring it back to your chair. And we'll do it this together, all right, as a family. So get it, but then just hold on to it, all right? Let's pray. Father God, just uh, thank you so much for this message, and uh, just thank you for a time to uh, just come together and share communion, and just as we uh, as we share this, pray that uh, we would just all think about what it really means, and uh, that this is your body and your blood sacrifice for us, God, and uh, just thank you so much for that sacrifice, for loving us, and coming down to earth and saving us, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, come on forward.
Well, I loved seeing our deacons. They, had, they elevated the tray according to the height of the person. That was good service. Isn't this an amazing kind of uh, ceremony that Christ instituted there for the church? He said, I want you to do this to remember, to remember. We're not here because of how good we are. We are here because he laid down his perfect life for messed up folks like us. That's love. Let's think about the love of God. Thank you, Jesus. Then sometimes what we do here is we toast the resurrection. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He bled for us. But he didn't stay in that grave. Let's raise our glasses. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.